want to begin by apologizing and hoping that you will bear with me. Um, English is not my first language and I feel like I'm moving through a universe where a lot of the terms are in Portuguese, so if anyone will be able to help me if I need. And I'm still jet lagged and going to a day and night of workshops and healing ceremonies, so I'm a little bit out of place. Um, I'd like to start by um, inviting all of you that can and are willing to participate in a short sacred dance from the Guarani tribe. Uh, it's one of the largest uh, Brazilian native populations and found along the coast and Mato Grosso state. And I wanted very much, since I learned a lot from the natives, to start, start by honoring their ancestry as part of inviting uh, for us to reflect on the qualities that are necessary to build a culture of sustainability. And I'd say this is one of the most important qualities. Um, and I think we're going to do it right there. So, um, I've been introduced as a cultural anthropologist, um, but I kind of just wanted to throw all that away and uh, speak and share, not as a researcher or as an anthropologist, but from my personal experience and from a place of knowledge through the time that I spent uh, studying and particularly in healing ceremonies with the plant ayahuasca, uh, which I'm assuming all of you know something about it or about her. Ayahuasca is considered a very feminine plant. Um, and it's a Quechua name, uh, the name that we use for the Unicuin tribe, which is where I've been studying, is Uni, which also means people. The Unicuin means the true people. Um, well, starting with, I was, I was trying to think what I wanted to talk about here, and I had a really hard time. Um, and then things that started pulsating in me had words and feelings that had to do with how are we able to connect or how are we able to bring this idea or this experience of sacredness into our lives and how are native and traditional peoples very much imbibed with this experience and what does the experience of sacredness has to do with being able to think about ecological balance and building a sustainable community or a sustainable paradigm and sacredness, in my understanding, is the capacity to connect. So it's not something necessarily that needs a mediator, as we're used to probably um, in, in this Western culture. Uh, we have a particular time and a particular place to be in contact with spirit or with the sacred, whether it's through a synagogue or a church. Um, and we usually have mediators or gurus that, that are supposed to be our vehicles of connection. And sacredness mm -hmm. is sort of this capacity to, to be present and to open yourself to this larger flux of the universe. And within this state of presence and connection, to receive knowledge and wisdom that allows you to conduce Conduce, conduct yourself, conduct yourself in a more integral manner on Earth, and could be on a daily basis. So the experience that I've been having with, and then I'm going to go back a little bit. I coordinate an NGO that basically works with education for sustainability, and there's a term in Portuguese that's very difficult to translate. It's said it's called convivio, which I guess could be translated to communal living, or living together, or living well, or relatedness and connected, connectedness. Um, so the focus of our work is, is educational for, for sustainability, but we have, one of our main branches is bringing indigenous culture and forest medicines into the elements of thinking sustainability, not only as a way of preserving your resources, but a way of connecting to the entire web of life and allowing nature to be a mentor and a guide to everything that we do. Um, whether it's in its design, or its forms of communication, or 
with the sharing of its medicine or just by the fact that nature has the, um, the inherent, inherent um, <coughs> uh, capa uh, no, no, uh, uh, right, the inherent rights to exist just because it pulsates life. And with the Unicorn NGO, we've been, I've been working with Jawa Boni now. We, we bring, we invite tribes, representatives from different tribes in Brazil to bring their forest medicines and to share their healing through their traditional ways. And we've been working with Jawa Boni for the past seven years. So it's really interesting because the NGO is really close to an urban center and the people who are coming to our NGO to partake in these healing circles are from a very, very urban, very Western mind frame. And the healing we do in a very traditional Kashinawa manner. Um, and the experiences we've been collecting in this work, and I, I'm going to speak much more from a subjective manner and from my personal experience, not too much from a scientific point of view. Uh, we've been having people uh, opening space so that people can access, I guess you could call them mystical experiences as well. And through the healing of this work and the ayahuasca, they're able to add layers of understanding, not layers of understanding, but they're, they're able to expand their vision about how they are and how they can do, conduct themselves in the world and the kind of responsibility that they need. We spend most of our time very disconnected on a daily basis from everything and we're disconnected from our emotions. And I think it was Genesee. Genesee was talking about how other psychedelics or entheo entheogens they bring to the sur surface material that is there. Ayahuasca does that as well. And we have the trust that not only we know that it's going to bring the material, but we know it's the material that the, pers the person needs to work, spiritually speaking, needs to sort of reorganize these elements. So we have people coming into our NGO with all kinds of depressions or um, addictions, chemical addictions, and with traumas, very destructuring traumas in their lives. And sometimes they're not aware of the, of the memories that they have. And in a ceremony, ayahuasca will open and give them access to these memories. And sometimes it's very frightful as well. But I think it's not a difference, but I think what I would say in, in, in relation to the experience with MDMA or other psychedelics is that we sort of believe there is, there is an energetic sustenance to the work that, that goes beyond only the psychology of the material that the person is accessing and that the plant itself has a personal wisdom, a personal ability to guide the people in what they need. And the chanting which is sacred and the knowledge that the Kashinawa in particular bring for this for the, for the work guide as well and start opening sort of like channels, like you open the chakras and start opening channels so that the person can start uh, processing this work. The processing, it's very difficult to explain because we're very used to a black and white sort of vision of how things work, so um, polarities, are very present in our lives. We work with like either this or that. There's a sort of like duality in our language. And a lot of people, when they come to our work, they are really frightened about the physical and harsh emotional and mental experiences that they have. Uh, in particular, all the purging and diarrhea that ayahuasca usually induces. And our understanding of that comes from a, a, a different mind frame or a different logic and we, we've we noticed that when people partake in this profound spiritual experience they need to allow their inner home to sort of empty up 
and cleanse that. And so at the same time that they suffer through the experience because they're observing um, wounds that are part of their life, the path of healing has to go through this painful experience, not because we're masochistic, but because we've observed this is what's uh, been, what's allowed people to go through the most profound changes. So you get situations or examples of people who come into our work um, for 10, 10, from 10 or 15 years of depression and they're in a very vulnerable state which allows them to really give in to the experience. And when they work with the plants, a lot of the, when we see these people and their suffering process, and for the first years that I started working, I would get very worried and Jawabani said, look, don't worry if you see them throwing up, if you see them crying, that's the, the deeper they're suffering, the deeper is the process of change as well. Um, so, mm. ayahuasca taught me many interesting things, going back to the capacity to see. It's sort of like, um, a microscope and a telescope all in one and because we haven't practiced this capacity to connect on a daily basis whether it's from uh, contemplative exercises or meditative exercises we've we're starting to lack the capacity to to see what's the responsibility that we have and to understand that there are many um, many interpretations to the same reality. So one of the important things, and I think this is very much connected to the process of cultivating empathy, is that ayahuasca can allow you to go into a particular conflict, whether it's in your family or at your work or with your partner, and ha remove you from your state of vision, from your narrow, limited eyesight, and bring you to an experience of, of an, as an observer and allow you to see all the different aspects of that same reality. When that happens, everything that was certain starts losing its certainty. And that's really interesting because we live in a very bellic society and we live in a bellic society because we're so certain about the reality that we create and we live. And the first thing that ayahuasca does is, instead of offering more answers, it brings more questions into our life. And I'd say it's probably one of the greatest gifts that I've been able to have in the past 10 years that I've been con consecrating, consecrating, oh. uh, co in communion with the ayahuasca, yeah, is, is, is the capacity to question whether I'm entirely right or whether there's only one answer or one way of seeing that particular reality. In that sense, it's really interesting because once you start cultivating and exercising this capacity of seeing beyond or seeing that, or at least considering that there are other possibilities to that reality, once you enter into a conflict, whatever conflict that is, you won't um, trigger a reactive kind of response. You'll have the time to observe and to consider that that person with that trajectory also has some kind of reason. And in that sense, it nourishes the empathic process because it allows you to not only understand, but it allows you to, it helps you to connect to the other person's suffering or problem or issue, not only cognitively, but emotionally as well. And Ayahuasca is very curious because it allows you to expand that not only with other human beings, but really people who have gone through the experience. A lot, especially the, the beginners, have 
I wouldn't say the same experience, but some of the elements are always present, and those elements are uh, having a complete visceral, emotional, spiritual experience of connecting to a greater whole, which is life itself, and connecting to animals, connecting to the forest, and connecting to peoples, and even sometimes connecting to the suffering of ancestors or, or people who have lived in the past, or even to peoples in different countries. I personally was taken once to an Asian farming village and was sitting with a family of farmers who were starving. And so once these experiences, which are very, very intense, become part of this healing circle, they facilitate our capacity to first be able to be present and observe. When we're present and we observe, we're able to connect better. When we're able to connect, we're able to support life. And in that sense, in my understanding of sustainability or how we work at the NGO um, with, I wouldn't say sustainability paradigm, but the culture of sustainability, one of the important elements is to be able to act and choose and live in a way where you're supporting life systems in general. And in order to do that, you must cultivate generosity and empathy and presence um, and responsibility, which is another thing that I've learned from the ayahuasca experiences, how to be a caretaker of the land. A lot of native tribes consider the body, our physical body, completely related to the, the health in our body is related to the health of the body of the earth. And so in order to cultivate this space of, of sacredness and integral, integral health, the, we need to nourish the capacity to dialogue constantly with the elements of nature and with, all, with the entire web of life. Um, the Guarani, going back to the Guarani, which I'm always really inspired by them, uh, just because they're, they, they were the first tribal people who, got, who were in contact with the colonization period, so they've been decimated. Does that, does that word exist? Yes. Okay, they, they've been decimated and they barely have any uh, indigenous territories. And for the past few years, they've gone through a lot of conflicts and there's a lot of a farmer take robbing whatever indigenous land there is there, and a lot of assassinations of the people. Um, so the Guarani, they work very much with these healing circles, and the power of sound and the power of chanting is fundamental for them. They even have an exercise where you express um, the vowels of your name as honoring the embodied energy of that person and each vowel is it's really interesting it's almost connected to the chakras as well so each vowel will produce an effect on a different energy point um, and they say that us Westerners have lost this um, we're, have lost no we're, we're dealing with sickness because the elements that are within us, fire, water, air, and earth, and that are outside in all of nature, they're not in dialogue anymore with that outer nature uh, structure. And that we need to learn how to connect to those elements outside and to the elements inside. And each element is related to a different dimension. So earth, body, water, emotion, air, mind, and fire, spirit. Um, the Kashinawa or Hunikuin, those are the, the ethnic tribe where Jawaboni comes from, have a similar vision in the sense that in order to be healthy, one needs to be whole in your conversation, in your connection, in your respect with the forest beings and the animal spirits as well. They have a name for uh, spirit and it's called Yushin. And I took a really long time to understand that, and it's really still kind of confusing because Yushin is, um, it's a spirit, but it's also the owner of that thing, or the, or the spiritual owner of a particular thing, and you can find Yushin in a headdress or in a, in a rattle 
or in the animals. And they believe that once uh, people are sick, they're usually sick because they've undergone, either they hunted and they were disrespectful with the animal when they ate the animal, or they were disrespectful with nature and they weren't present when they were removing something from nature. And so the Yushins, which are the owners of these spirits, they become angry and they bring disease. And that's really interesting because if you create a sort of cosmology that is constantly understanding that the web of life is in communication with you and that you depend and are responsible for being a caretaker, I mean that you depend on the, this web of life, it's much easier to work with